I figured it out. Excellent. Um, I am Laura Hum. I'm one of the Dialogue Doctor editors, and I am here with John Kraus today um, talking about, um, John, did I say your last name correctly? Yes, John Kraus. Excellent. Uh, we're talking about a middle grade book two in a series today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your writing journey, and the book? Yes. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thanks for having me on. My name is John Krause. I live in the Madison, Wisconsin area, and I have always loved reading and I always loved books. I always love, still love going to the library and um, back, you know, just way, way in the back of my mind, um, thought writing books would be a, a fun thing to do. And I spent nearly two decades in the insurance industry uh, in, in the corporate world and a couple of years ago, I decided I was in a headspace during the pandemic. Uh, I want to write a story of a character who's just been in my head for many, many years. And so I sat down on my computer and I just started some character profiles and some plot ideas and everything just really flowed out uh, very quickly. And about a year ago, um, I was ready for a change in my career and my wife and I had taken a, a look at our finances. Um, I had written a first draft of, of this book series that I wanted to do and I'd gotten a lot of positive feedback on it. And my wife is a ceramic artist who had put her ambitions aside for many years to raise the kids at home. So we made a decision that I would quit my job and we would both form a business together. She to do her ceramic art under that and for me to write full time under that. And so for the past year, I've been working to uh, get three books, uh, three first three books of this series published in 2023 self-published, so I've been learning all of the ins and outs of that, uh, finding my own editor, uh, cover designer, illustrator, and, and going just through the whole works on that. So this is a middle grade, what I'll call contemporary fiction series. It's not fantasy or sci-fi or, or historical fiction. Um, it takes place in the modern day. The character's name is Pudge Amazon. And his name comes from just a wordplay that I've had in my head for many, many years when my kids were, were little. And it was nine o'clock at night and I'm trying to corral them to bed. It says, time to go to bed, get your pajamas on. Pajamas on, pajamas on. Hey, that could be a really fun name for a, a character. And this is not my first foray into writing or even publishing, I guess technically, I did uh, work on the school, my high school newspaper and some, some submissions into my high school's literary magazine. I actually won an award for a humorous essay that I submitted. Uh, I would write humorous poetry every month in the school newspaper. I'd have a funny poem that I would uh, do. Uh, about 15 years ago, I took a uh, I guess the internet was around 15 years ago, believe it or not, but it was a via mail correspondence course, the Institute of Children's Literature based in Connecticut, um, where I took a writing course and you know, the local library, I did some stuff there. Uh, so this isn't my, my first venture into writing by writing this book. Uh, it was certainly my first venture into actually writing a full novel. And... Uh, you know, in a series to boot mm -hmm. um, and, and to publish it and, and to make a career out of it. Yeah. So Pudge, he is 11 years old. He's in fifth grade. And he is very adventurous. He's extroverted. Um, he likes to be the center of attention. Uh, very just dive in if there's a problem. Or if, or if there's fun to be had, he just dives right in. Um, he's, he's a little bit uh, 
under tall, we'll say, which uh, <laughs> gives him his nickname, uh, Pudge. Uh, it's not his real name. Um, if you read the first book, which will be coming out this summer, August 2023, you'll learn what his real name is. Um, but he's he's an adventurous kid. He's, he's free-spirited, fun-loving. Um, I, I think kids who read this will, will uh, relate to him on a lot of ways and, and really enjoy the character. Uh, Pudge's best friend, his name is Rocky. Before Rocky. we get, sorry, before we get into all okay. the characters, oh, let's, sure. let's, yeah, let's just take a second um, and talk about what our goal is today. So you yeah, sure. sent me the first two chapters of book two, mm -hmm. um, where Pudge and his friends are going to get into yet another adventure. Um, and the thing that you wanted us to focus on were, was is the dialogue natural and realistic for 10 and 11 year olds, which can be definitely a challenge for adults to capture the correct voice of a, of a 10 and 11 year old, because many of us are a few years away from that, <laughs> which makes it a little bit harder. But you also asked the question about does the character, do the characters have distinctive voices from one another? Um, so quick question for you before we delve more into the four main characters in the story. What made you pick um, the middle grade 10 and 11 year olds for, the, for this series? Well, I don't know that I ever had a, just a point. It's like, well, this is going to be a middle grade series. It just kind of just naturally felt like this is what it should be. I actually originally had thought of this character um and I actually had a blog many many years ago when blogging I guess it still is kind of a thing but when it was first coming out and I would write these little funny vignettes or or things observations of life but I actually wrote a little thing about Pudge Amazon who was uh like an Indiana Jones character I think it's kind of similar right because Amazon's a geographical feature as, as well as mm -hmm. Indiana there's kind of that little connection there and uh, he was an adult uh, actor who, who starred in a, an adventure series and then ends up in the jungles in some exotic location. And the uh, the locals don't realize he's an actor and they think he's the real, you know, a real adventurer. And so, mm -hmm. well, when I sat down to actually write the story, I said, well, I don't think that's really going to work. That's not what I want to write. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it was really a conscious decision um it just felt natural that okay this is this is who this character is he's got to be a kid who gets into scrapes and then by using his his resourcefulness and his wit and his tenacity he gets out of scrapes um that, that's kind of really what the the whole premise of of the series is uh you know he does it in, in humorous ways you know yeah um that's, that's but, but but thinking on it you know after the fact is i really like the middle grade age group um for fiction because really you can do kind of anything i mean yeah there's science fiction for middle grade there's there's fantasy there's historical there's mysteries there's ghost stories and there's certain certainly different genres but say like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you could not write that with adults winning golden tickets and touring a chocolate factory. It just it just wouldn't work, right? That only works if if it's kids, you know, 10, 9, 10, 11 year old kids. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'm I'm attracted to the the middle grade age group for fiction just because really you can kind of do anything. <laughs> I um, and, I agree. I, I love it, make it work. So yeah. I love the middle grade stories for exactly that reason. You can have this fantastical world um, and have it also be very real life. I love that. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're currently doing to ensure that your character voices are realistic for that age group? Do you have any tips or tricks you're already using, or is that something that you really like? You feel like you want to work on that more, and haven't really spent a lot of your artistic time in that arena. Well, I, I haven't, and so I'm, hopefully this our time <laughs> together will help me 
improve that. Now, book one, the, the text is done. Mm -hmm. I don't have any intentions of going back. So if there sure. are issues with the dialogue there, it's like, well, maybe they'll just have to be uh, set in concrete. Um, but I've, I've gotten really good feedback. Uh, yeah. from writing groups, critique groups, that the dialogue just feels natural. Right. You know, even from teachers, you know, teachers who taught elementary school or middle grade have been around kids this age. Good. You know, for decades. Like, you know, this sounds like you know, your characters sound like kids. So that was very encouraging to me. Um, not to say that I, I can't work on polishing that or improving that. Sure. Way. Um, but I I mean there there are some things that you know, I have consciously been aware of and let me work on, you know, doing line editing for myself, you know, or talking to critique groups or, or my own editors, like um, watch for these things. Like Pudge, he speaks in he, contractions. Mm -hmm. um, even contractions, okay, like can't and don't, I mean, those are pretty obvious ones, but uh, like, oh, my mom will, He'll say my mommel, you know, M O M apostrophe N L L. Mm -hmm. and that's how it's written on the page. Sure. Um, and he uses gonna and wanna and let me, you know, instead of let me, you know, that's how I write it on the page mm -hmm. um, to really show he's uh, he's he's talking faster than he's thinking, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's one of his characteristics. Okay. And. So that, that's, I mean, that, the error is, is a conscious thing. Whereas the adults in the book don't use contractions. So they, I mean, unless it's mm -hmm. really awkward to not use them, um, but they will use I will or do not, mm -hmm. cannot. Um, and that's a way, to, you know, conscious way for me to help the reader distinguish this is a kid talking versus this is an adult talking. Or the adults will use, I don't use purple prose or any flowered mm -hmm. language, but the adults will use bigger words. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the kids, it's like, you know, trying to make a conscious effort if they're not going to use something that, <laughs> you know, kids at that age just wouldn't, you know, or they would never use. So, Excellent. Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about your four main characters and talk a little bit about how we can help you really refine each of their voices in, because the first scene that you've given us is actually a large group scene. Um, mm -hmm. You have four characters who are very present in those first two scenes. So we want to make sure that we know how the voices are going to work together. Additionally, um, just for the sake of time, um, you've already told us about Pudge. Um, he has two friends, Rocky and Taylor, and Rocky has a new girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And that's causing some friction in the group. So can you tell us briefly about Rocky and Taylor so we can get the idea of the three friend group? And then I'd like to spend our time talking about Pudge and is it Jeannie or Jenny? Jenny. 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 Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Sure. That's the dynamic that's new in this book, correct? Okay. That is okay. correct. Yes. Okay, so Rocky is personality wise is the complete opposite uh, of Pudge. So he's he's introverted, he's nervous, anxious, and he's a rule follower, right? Uh, you know, when when now deep deep down he loves being with Pudge and loves going on these adventures because it's you know it's, it's a way for him to uh, you know have have some excitement in his life, but. but but on the outside, he's just very much a rule follower, and that causes friction between the two of them um, mm -hmm. throughout the whole series. You know, Pudge wants to just dive right in. Uh, you know, rules be danged, and uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, to an extent, right? I mean, he's still a kid and he still has to defer to authority to some extent. Uh, whereas Pudge is, or sorry, Rocky is always saying, you know, "Is this the right thing? Should we be doing this? I don't know about this." I mean, there's a lot of that kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, dialogue from him. Taylor is in between the two of them. Uh, yeah. You know, as I, as I did personality profiles um, and develop these characters, she is she's a new 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 kid in town. Um, so that's how she's introduced in book one. 
and she's a new kid in town. Um, and you know, Pudge and and Rocky become her her first friends. And uh, so her personality is, is in between. Uh, she's a she's a skate a skater skateboarder. Um, and you know, she has that adventurous spirit, but she's also very shy and very unsure of herself. Uh, you know, I, I am aware, you know, I have three girls of my own. And so you know, knowing at this age, you know, it's about the, about this age where girls start to, um, maybe become a little bit unsure of themselves. And, and that I think, uh, comes out in, in Taylor's dialogue as well. Um, but given her personalities on both ends, she's really a nice buffer, uh, between Pudge and Rocky, um, and can kind of smooth over some of the, uh, any friction between the two of them. Right. So, that, so that's that's the the trio dynamic in a nutshell. Okay. And what about Jenny? So Jenny is Rocky's new girlfriend. And and the way I'm envisioning this is that Rocky is attracted to now now these are kids, right? There's not going to be mushy stuff, kissing, mm -hmm. you know, I mean the, the extent of boyfriend girlfriend relationship when you're in fifth grade is passing notes and at least that's what I'll put in my books I mean out in the real mm -hmm. world maybe it's more involved than that but sure. um you know I, I mean I, I don't want these to be romance books right I mean, sure. it's really... well but P Rocky is attracted to Jenny in the same way he's attracted to to Pudge uh personality wise is because she is has a very similar personality to Pudge she wants to um and be the center of you know she wants to control the conversation she wants to uh control the action of what's going on um she wants to take the lead um of of what's happening um in the situation and pudge is jealous uh you know it's been him and rocky for many years there's been no yeah, Taylor came on board as a new friend, but she doesn't threaten. She's not threatening in any way. But Jenny is now taking Rocky's attention away, and Pudge is jealous of that. And um, so that's causing a lot of friction between the two. Um, Pudge is like, well, hey, I didn't invite you into this friend group, you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, but you know, Rocky is he, he likes her and he certainly um so you know he he's got a bit of you know some internal conflict as well of like, well, how do I keep a good relationship with my best friend, but also uh this girl I like, you know, I can be spending quality time together without Pudge interfering. Okay. So when you say there's a lot of conflict between Jenny and Pudge, how does that conflict come out? Is it they're both trying to get Rocky's attention, so they're talking over each other? Or are they like trying to put the other one down and it becomes much more like mean-spirited? Or is it more like all in good fun, but there's a little bit of truth underneath of this dynamic? Oh, it's it's the they're they're putting each other down. They're lobbing insults at each other. Um, and you know, I, I could quote some passages here from my, my current draft of what's of what that is. But um, yeah, there it's it's. I'd say it's mean spirited, um, okay. which I want to make sure isn't too over the top and doesn't turn off readers. You know, I want the character to still be likable and relatable. Um, but I, I think I want to write this so it's funny, right? As, as uh -huh. people are reading this and they're sharing, you know, they're lobbing jabs back and forth, um, that the readers are going to laugh and not be shocked. <laughs> Yeah. So that was actually one of the questions that I had for you in that back and forth between Pudge and Jenny is if it's coming from a place of they're trying to be mean to each other, um, that's a very different story 
than if they're both trying to get Rocky to laugh by saying something not nice about somebody else, right? Um, so like some of your, some of the jokes that you have in there when they're like fighting with each other is something like, are you a baby? You know, can I borrow your diaper, right? Like those kinds of things. If those are intended to be mean, to each other, that's a very different story than if it's like, oh, I'm trying to be funny. Rocky, look at me and how funny I can be while I'm putting down your friend slash girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, it also changes the dynamics of the places where there's conflict between them because they're trying to get Rocky's attention. Um, and so that's the question from a middle grade perspective, I would think that you would want to stay away from the mean spirited relationship and make it more like, Hey, I'm the one who's usually the center of attention. I'm usually fun loving. So that means that I'm cracking jokes all the time about all of us. So now I just happen to be directing those jokes at your girlfriend slash your best friend so it can stay all in good fun. But when they get frustrated with each other, that's when they turn it on each other and the jokes go away and it's more accusatory. You, 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 that sort of thing, but not actually the mean spirited, like the joking goes away and it comes from more of a place of like, you're stealing my best friend slash you're stealing my boyfriend. Um, because I'm not sure that the mean spirited will translate in a joking form for the, those, um, like fifth and sixth grade readers. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, that's, that's definitely a good point. And I've, I've had some feedback from my writing groups of, oh, Jenny just comes across as really mean here. And it's like, well, I, I want... I, I want character. I want the readers to um, and to latch on to, to right. these characters so that they will follow them through, keep reading, and follow them through the whole journey. Right. I still want to have conflict there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at a reasonable level because conflict is what's going to drive the narrative mm -hmm. um, and and bring up problems that these kids need to solve. Yep. And I also do want to have uh, a very clear contrast at the end, because to, to give a little bit of the plot here, Jenny goes missing. Mm -hmm. And at first, Pudge is happy. It's like, well, good. She's off doing her own mm -hmm. thing. She went to the bathroom. Uh, the three of us, you know, we're back to our, our my safe trio, mm -hmm. where I'm, where I'm uh, the leader of the pack. And... Well, then they start looking for her and he gets increasingly worried something bad has happened. Um, so, you know, he's not evil. <laughs> he's not, right. um, well, then they, then they have an adventure. The meat of the story, they have an adventure in the woods looking for her um, where, you know, conflict intensifies. Uh, we can talk about that, I guess, a little bit more, but that's not really the focus of this, uh, this discussion here. But at the very end of the story, Pudge and Jenny have reconciled and they are now friends. They understand each other. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to make sure that there is a clear contrast. You know, I mean, if they're friends at the beginning and then the friends at the end, it's like, well, there's not really, I mean, there's not, right. There's no relationship development to, to help drive the story. Uh, sure. Absolutely. So, so I, I guess is, is what you're telling me here is, is yeah, I, I want to be careful not to make it mean spirited from a place of like these two just absolutely hate each other and if they were adults they'd be you know pulling out weapons um or they wouldn't but, spend time with each other they wouldn't spend time with each other right they would just yeah. really avoid each other yeah um so so yeah I, I think that makes sense and i'll have to think about a, a good way to do that so like, okay uh each of them are vying for rocky's attention uh, I think I can make that work. Um, and then maybe things escalate a little bit. They have some really harsh words for each other. 
but maybe that's only you know just a couple of lines of dialogue you know until okay then then she goes missing and then we really kick off uh, the story um i guess that's how i'm thinking of it now that you're talking to me i mean i guess what yeah what you think to that to start it out maybe a little so more jokey and then maybe it escalates but just for a short period of time and then the inciting incident kicks off yeah i think the way that you can do it is if pudge is if his personality is to make jokes and put Rocky and Taylor down, like, you know, like this idea that, oh, because, you know, fifth and sixth graders, the, the worst thing that you can do is call them a baby, right? Like, because this is all about, I'm a grown up now age group, that 10, 11, 12, they just can't wait to be adults. So being called a baby is like the worst thing ever. And you have kind of a couple of threads in there. But if they're also used to like, joking around with each other and um I don't know if you um read Paper Towns um when we did the book club a couple of uh months weeks I don't know I don't understand time um we we read Paper Towns uh by I think it was John Green I don't know Tom is going to be Tom I'm sorry I can't remember the title uh, or the author's name <laughs> But in that story, the group of three friends, obviously high schoolers, so not the same age group, but their whole dynamic was seeing who could put each other down the most, but it mm. was all in good fun. There was like no mean spirit about it. If Pudge is used to doing that with Rocky and Taylor, if you've kind of created that dynamic where like, like they're just joking with each other about things like that. Um, I think that that could work if Pudge is directing that to Jeannie. And if Jeannie, or excuse me, Jenny, if Jenny is doing that same thing where like poking fun at people and it doesn't necessarily have to be just them, but like just the class clown kind of joking around, I think it works really well. And as we start looking at some of the dialogue, um, there are some places where, and actually, you know what, I'll just, I'll give it to you now. So like the joking about you're a scaredy cat, you're a baby, like those kinds of things feel like they're all in good fun. But when you have a line where Pudge uses a contraction with the wrong grammar yeah. and Jeannie jumps on him and like, basically makes him feel dumb for not using the word correctly and they have a conflict where um you know he says something about like this is an english class and she's like yeah but you need to have your grammar better right like that felt more mean spirited and less in good fun um where is the stuff about like oh you're a scaredy cat i'm so bored on this ride that you really want to like that felt like it was still in the realm of fun so i would say the the question that you would want to ask yourself when you start having them sling mud at each other is if this were being would pudge say this to rocky or taylor or would Jenny say it to Rocky or Taylor? If the answer is yes, then it probably falls in the realm of funny. Right. If it becomes an attack or an aggressive act between the two of them, you probably want to take those insults out and leave that conflict there. Because there are some places in the story where, um, so in, in the story you have, Jenny saying it's Rocky's turn to pick the ride because they're at like a carnival and yeah. Pudge is like but you've been picking all the rides and then they look at Rocky and Rocky doesn't say anything and then I can't remember which one of them says the next ride name that they want to go on and then that's the place where I feel like the conflict can come in a really realistic way where if Jenny's the one who starts answering for Rocky, then Pudge needs to jump in and be like, you said it was Rocky's turn. You can't talk. And then the other one can be like, well, you've been dominating the conversation the whole time. And then they're fighting about like 
who should be giving Rocky the chance to talk, but neither one of them are actually giving Rocky the chance to talk, right? Because that's how that's how conflict can happen without it necessarily being mean or mean spirited. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Excellent. So then the question becomes, and you know, this would be the same advice we would give to anyone writing this kind of dynamic in where, you know, there's somebody new in the group, somebody really likes them, somebody else doesn't really like them. But let me ask you this, how does Taylor feel about Jenny being part of the group? Oh, that's that's a good question. And that doesn't really come through in these first two chapters that you read. In, in the next chapter, uh, they just, they, they, a little bit of a compromise. So again, I, they, they, or maybe I hadn't mentioned this, they have a mandate, they're, the car they're at the carnival and they have a mandate from their parents that they have to stick together. Mm -hmm. There's no parental supervision going on. Here. So, you know, four together, they have to stay together. But they have a compromise so that Jenny will stay by the, the exit line, you know, the exit ramp of one of the scary rides while the other three, Pudge, Rocky, and Taylor go on one of the scary rides. Well, while they're in line, Taylor makes a comment about how she's not having any fun because she doesn't like to see Jenny and, and uh, Pudge arguing, right? It's just, it's not any fun for her. So it, it does come out in, in, you know, a little bit later in the first act that, that she expresses her, her feelings. Um, but I could, I could add that, uh, you know, in these first two chapters, just to set that up a little bit. So um, I think it doesn't have to necessarily be how Rock, how Taylor feels about Jenny as much as it is, where is her role in the conversations? Because as I was reading, there were a couple of places where Pudge, Rocky, and Jenny were very involved in the conversation, and Taylor just kind of fades to the background. You want to make sure that she's like involved in the conversation. And if you have it set up, and this is typically what happens in a group dynamic, especially for somebody like Taylor, who you mentioned before is the buffer between Pudge and Rocky. So Taylor is usually the one who's like, I'm assuming smoothing things over when there's a conflict, when Pudge wants to do something adventurous and Rocky is like, but the rules say, but we're supposed to, feels like Taylor may be the one who's used to kind of like mitigating that. So when you bring, when you introduce Jenny, who is naturally going to be on Rocky's side because she's his girlfriend, then Taylor is more naturally going to gravitate to taking Pudge's side so Pudge doesn't feel ganged up on. Yeah. So when you're noticing that conflict, when Rocky starts jumping in, if Rocky is trying to smooth things over and get them to like come to like see it the same way, then Taylor's going to take Rocky's side and be like, yeah, let's compromise. If Rocky is taking Jenny's side, then you want Taylor to take Pudge's side because that's what somebody who is used to being the mitigator or the buffer is going to do. They're going to stand next to the person who's feeling the weakest to kind of balance the odds. Um, so that's where you can put Taylor in which means that if Rocky and Jenny like step aside to have a conversation, you can have Pudge and Taylor having a conversation and Pudge can be like, she's spoiling the whole thing. And Taylor can say, well, you're not helping fighting with her every second, right? Like, so I'm not having any fun too, the way you have it being expressed, but also blaming that on Pudge. Because yes, Taylor can take Pudge's side when there's some conflict happening and Rocky's taking Jenny's side. But when it's just Pudge and Taylor, Taylor seems like while she's unsure of herself, she seems to be, as you're describing her, the like almost the adult of the group. The voice of reason, I think, is a yes, better way. Right. That's that's how I would uh how I would describe her, yeah. Excellent. So those are some tools that you can you can use as you're writing the character voices to kind of figure out the different things that they might say or that they might talk about. So now let's, 
I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to okay. show what you've actually given us. Um, let me find it. And I'd like to look at some of the dialogue itself to show kind of the places where um, maybe we can take some of the language and make it more of that middle grade language. Sure. So you mentioned earlier that one of the things that you try to do with the dialogue is use bigger, more educated words for the adults and smaller words for the kids. That is absolutely like the number one tip that we use when we're saying children's dialogue. Children just, unless you have a child whose background is really about like learning vocabulary words or like studying and is very studious, in general, smaller words tend to be better. There are a couple of other things about the way children think that can help us as we're evaluating our dialogue. Now, when I work with authors who are writing children's voices, I always suggest, and this is why I asked the question earlier, like, how are you doing this? I always suggest that in their first pass of writing, they just write what feels natural to them in the dialogue because they're used to thinking like an adult. Mm -hmm. It's when you go back through the editing process that you can start spotting some of the things that adults do and use your secret decoder ring to translate that into what children say and how they think. So we can talk about a couple of those things as well. The number one thing besides language and the difference children use in language than adults that I always recommend is understanding how children process logically. Mm -hmm. So adults tend to think about things in a linear fashion, not always, but typically things happen linearly, which means logical thought processes happen. One thing leads to another thing. Children do not process thoughts that way. They focus on the thing that is most important to them emotionally or feelings wise. And that's the thing that elevates to the top of what they're thinking. So let's take a look here at the dialogue that you had, and I can kind of point out some moments. Sure. So they're at the carnival, and Pudge is so excited about riding the ride called the, the Death, Death spiral. spiral, right? Awesome name for a ride. Is this a real ride, or did you make it up? I made it up. You made it up. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So Pudge says, awesome, tugging on Rocky's shirt. Let's do this one first. The line isn't that long. So the excitement of the ride for a kid should be the thing that is most important to them. It's only adults who care about lines, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're conditioned that uh, anything worth waiting for, you got to stand in line for. People stand in line overnight to buy shoes, right? Like lines are a thing that are frustrating. Kids don't necessarily think about that in the same way. So what I did here is I just took out the let's do before the this one first and I crossed out the line isn't that long because he doesn't care if this is the one he wants to go on. He's going to wait in line for two hours if he has to, because mm -hmm. that's the thing that he wants. Right. So instead of awesome, let's do this one first. The line isn't that long. I suggested that we make it awesome. This one first. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's the yeah. only thing he thinks about. It's the only thing he cares about. Then Rocky's response is later, I still have to digest my dinner. Digesting my dinner is a very adult way to think about how your stomach feels. Mm -hmm. A kid is probably going to say something like, I just ate, I'll puke, or I don't want to puke, right? So it's that same concept 
of why I don't want to do this, but it's less about what needs to happen in order to get me there and more about why I can't do it right now. So the difference in thinking, because adults are, we're conditioned to always thinking about what happens next. Um, my spouse yells at me about this all the time. Like I'll be halfway through a vacation and I'm already planning the next vacation, right? I'll be halfway through breakfast and I'll start talking to them about what are we going to have for lunch, right? Like it's always about the next and the next and the next. And not all, all adults are like that. And maybe I am more toward the next than other people are. But in general, the older we get, the more things we have on our plate. So we have to start thinking about what, where we go from here. Kids, it's all about this moment right here, right now. Yeah. The future doesn't matter so much unless there's something imposing a consequence on what we're doing or a reward on what we're doing. And that's when they're going to start thinking about what happens next. So then, so now we've, we've all, this also makes your dialogue go just a little bit faster, um, yeah. which yeah. can be a good thing. Um, so then Taylor said, I'm sick just watching it. Again, this is a very adult way of processing why I don't want to get on this thing versus something like no way, right? Like just kind of pushing back without really having any understanding of why they're pushing back is a another thing that children do that adults don't do. Adults are used to having to justify everything. We have to have a reason. Why are we calling in sick to work? Well, we have to have a reason. It's not just, well, I don't feel like working today. We have to be sick or our kid is sick or we need to get the oil changed or whatever it is. There has to be a reason. Kids don't need a reason. Nope, not doing it. Don't want to. Don't feel like it, right? Like those are very kid oriented feelings. So then we have Jenny grabbing Rocky's hand. I want to do the easy rides first. That's a very definitive statement. And this idea of easy rides versus hard rides mm -hmm. might be better served as the idea of small or slow versus big and fast versus easy and hard. Just kind of a different way of processing the world easy and hard is kind of how we evaluate things as adults, but kids tend to think about the world based off of scale yeah. and their interaction with it. Now, these elements here are kind of specific to your story because it's about um, kind of the, this carnival, but these ideas are are also translated into other places in other stories. This idea that kids feel emotion first rather than thinking about logic and consequences. Um, let's say when, and you didn't give me these chapters, so I'm just making stuff up, but let's say that they're wandering through the woods and it's starting to get dark. One of them saying, you know, um, hey, we got to get back because it's getting dark soon and we're not going to be able to see. That might be something that an adult would say. A yeah. kid is going to process that more like, I can't, I can't see anymore. Can, you know, it, it's getting just the it's getting dark part. Um, we're never going to find her if we can't see. Right. Like these immediate emotional without the consequences. Um, if they do say we need to be getting out of here, it's going to be we need to go. And then maybe the other one is like, we can't go until we find her, but we're going to get lost, too. Right. It's not this. We can't see. We're going to get lost. We're not going to be able to get out. It's just this immediate focus of what's causing the most internal tension at one time. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, well, I guess that is a predictable plot point. I mean, carnivals happen at night and they're in the woods at night. And that's exactly <laughs> what happens in later chapters is they're 
their phones die and they don't have lights or flat, you know, flashlight that they come across um, runs out. I'll, I'll have to check that then and just keep that in mind. But I, as you're saying that, I, I think I, uh, I am reflecting the immediacy of the moment. I don't think any of them says, oh, we need to get back. It's getting dark. I think they right. say, I can't see anymore, just the way you right. said yeah. it. So. Yeah. Um, and then scale also. So like when we were talking about easy versus hard, small versus big, slow versus fast, those kinds of things, those can be translated into understanding of the world and the scope of the world right? Like, so as adults, we, our world is so much bigger because we, maybe we've traveled, maybe we've gone to school, maybe we've met people who have traveled. So our world is so much bigger. So when we're using references, we have to make sure that at the child level, there are references that they would know or understand. And children tend to not use cliches or um, idioms, they tend to use, you know, just experience of their own understanding. There isn't an example of that right here. Um, but it is something that, oh, there is an example of this right here. So um, the humdrum pudge scoffs because um, Jenny wants to ride something small or easy. Um, so she points at a kitty ride and pudge is really mad because he wants to ride the death spot, yeah. right? Like, so he says that's for four-year-olds. Four-year-olds is something very specific. Mm -hmm. Adults understand kind of the growth progression of children, but children see each other as babies, our age, older kids, and adults, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So instead of saying four-year-olds, we want to take that phrase, use it the same way, but that's a baby, right? Anybody younger than me is a baby. And that's that using the relativity of the child's world as opposed to an adult lens. Um, and then the last one I'll show you here is this one where um, G, uh, Jenny again says, it looks easy, the line is short. Again, those are experiences that adults have for okay, we can do this one because it looks easy and the line is short. Again, kids don't care if they want to do something, if they're excited about it, they're going to write like, if you want to go into the line is short and we won't have to wait, we can do it right now or we'll have time to do another one or, you know, and then we can get a snack, whatever it is. So, you know, just that really immediate, this is my world. It's only this big. So we have to think about it based off of what it is and not what we've been conditioned to in our culture as adults. So this also works for storytelling. Um, this idea of there's an immediacy to storytelling. Anyone who has ever had kids or talked to kids knows when you ask them how their day was, you're about to go on a roller coaster yeah. because the story is not going to go in order, right? It's not going to be, well, I got out of bed and I went to school and the teacher taught us this and then this and then this. It's, you know, we, there was, there was a test in math class and then um, I had a cookie at lunchtime and then we were at gym and all of a sudden, like, what are all these things happening, right? Because it's it's about the thing that's most important to them. Or they say something like, you know, I got a sticker. Uh, okay. You ask how, what would what'd you do to get the sticker? And then all of a sudden they're talking about stuff that has nothing to do with the sticker. Yeah. And then they lost the sticker. And then they're right. Like it just, it, you just have to really hold on because yeah. they're telling the story based off of their emotional experience, not how we learn to tell stories as adults, which is this happened first and then this happened and then this happened. So you can use that as like, if they're talking to an adult about, hey, our friend is missing, you know, it's not going to be, our friend is missing. We were standing here. We, she was waiting for us. It's going to be like, we can't find her. You know, have you seen her? Have I seen who? Our friend, yeah. What what's her name? 
right? Like she was over there. Where were you standing, right? Like it had the story has to unfold in a very chaotic way. And children, when they're reading these stories, will latch on to that because they'll latch on to the emotion and allow it to unfold a little bit. So sometimes when you're writing children, specifically when you're writing children in an adult book, I always recommend that you take the story and you reverse it um, mm -hmm. and have the adult have to pull the details out of the kid to get to the beginning part of the story. When you're writing children talking to children, um, you might not have to reverse it, but you may have to pick and choose the highlights of what you're going to include. So those are my tips mm -hmm. and my suggestions. Um, I do have a couple of other um, notes that I put in the um track changes that I will yeah. send to you when we're done. Um, but before we wrap up, do you have any questions or is there anything you'd want to talk about? Oh, no, this is a lot to to digest. I'm thinking, you know, I said I, my my first manuscript is done for, for book one. Well, it hasn't been published yet. So I think I'll take another look at it and see if there are any spots where uh, maybe I can put some of these tips in there. And, um, because I mean, what you're doing here, I mean, what these these line edits here, what you've done is not. I mean, the, the progression of who's speaking and what the topic that they're talking about hasn't changed. It's just the word choice used, um, and so that's I, I guess that's good that um, you know, I, I can take a look at the dialogue without necessarily having to change. Absolutely. And Hot some, oh, sorry, go ahead. What'd you well, say? Without, yeah, I can, I can look, take a look and see if there's places I can change the dialogue without having to change the plot points or the progression of the, of the story. So. Absolutely. There are some places, and I'll go ahead and give you an example in here. Um, so right in here, um, so after they kind of talk about going on the slow ride and they tease each other about the ride isn't going anywhere. And, um, you know, again, joking all in good fun. Um, Jenny is adjusting the collar on Rocky's shirt, um, which at fifth grade could happen. Um, and then Pudge immediately attacks Rocky with this idea of why are you wearing that shirt anyway? And then Jenny comes to his defense with, doesn't my rock star look great? I helped him pick it out. And then turns to Rocky and is like, you look cute. So this exchange here feels a little bit more of a high school type mm -hmm. element. Like, do fifth graders really pick out? their girlfriend and boyfriend's clothes that felt so, so like there are some places in the dialogue where maybe something happens in the story that feels a little bit older but for the most part you could even take this and in take out the I helped him pick it out and even this like doesn't my rock star look great maybe it's more like you look just the you look cute, right? So while the conversation feels like maybe you could, maybe it does feel a little bit old, even that you could adjust it by just um, focusing on making the dialogue more age appropriate based off of those things. So um, especially going back to book one, as you're looking at book two, I would suggest finding places like this and being like, maybe this shirt conversation and going to church doesn't really have to be part of this conversation. Maybe we can just skip over this because mm -hmm. are they really going to take this moment where we're talking about lunch and talk about clothes? That feels much older. They're just going to stay focused on how much junk food they can possibly stomach Right. without their parents yelling at them or without them throwing up on their next ride, right? Um, so, but for book one, you're absolutely right. If you have time going back and looking at some of these 
just small tweaks to take out some of the more adult concepts can really make you feel like you are adjusting for the age group. The good thing though, is even if you don't make these changes, unless people are really spending a lot of time with children, the difference between the way it was reading and the way that it reads with the adjustments doesn't change your story. So your story is still going to be fun and interesting, even if you don't make these changes. So okay. any other thoughts or questions before we turn the recording off? No, no, this is great. I mean, this is very helpful. Um, I've, I've learned a lot here. So excellent. definitely right. helped me improve, uh, improve going forward. So. Yeah, excellent. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn the recording off. I have to stop sharing first, though. I learned that in my last session. People must get so tired of hearing me say, I don't know how to turn off the recording. <laughs>